Good evening. My name is Amy Bach, the Executive Director of United Policyholders, and I'm so uh, glad that you were able to find the time to be with us tonight and take advantage of a very important informative program that we've put together for you through our Roadmap to Recovery program on working with an industrial hygienist. Um, so if you'd like to follow uh, the slide deck that accompanies tonight's presentation, uh, you can go to our website, uphelp.org, and you see the link there, go to events, uh, click on tonight's event, partial losses working with an industrial hygienist, you see it circled there, um, and then you'll be able to um, click on that link that's got the yellow circle around it, um, and you'll be able to uh, open up the slide deck and follow along which I think for tonight's program is probably particularly will be helpful because we'll be talking about um, some terminology which may now be familiar to you, uh, but may not be. So, um, <clears throat> so I think that will be a good way of um, taking the best advantage of the expert panel that we have assembled for you this evening. You can go to the next slide, please. So just a reminder, uh, you may already be familiar with us, you probably are, um, but just in case, a reminder that we are a 501c3, so we're a nonprofit uh, like the Sierra Club or the Red Cross, um, but we have a very specific focus on disaster recovery and insurance um, and a lot of expertise in that uh, on that topic. Uh, we have been doing this work, meaning providing education and a menu of support services to people impacted by wildfires since 1991. Um, and we work in partnership with the Colorado Division of Insurance, as well as um, the mayors of your towns and the groups that have formed in the aftermath of the Marshall Fire. Um, when we say we're not for profit, not for sale, what we mean is we don't take funding from insurance companies um, and we don't sell anything. So um, you can trust that our information um, is in your best interest since we are a consumer advocacy group. So we're here to help you uh, at no charge. And we are funded by donations and grants. Um, and our team is includes professional staff. And we have with us tonight, Valerie Brown, um, who is lead on the ground there in the Marshall Fire uh, Roadmap Recovery Program, and also Carolyn Winter, who you can't see, uh, but who is an important person behind the scenes, um, making sure that the questions that got pre-submitted uh, got into our uh, got to our experts and and uh, will be addressed tonight. Um, we also have Annie Barber with us tonight, who is on our team uh, and is a person who went through a wildfire herself, lost a home. Um, a no number of her neighbors, although she was a total loss. A number of her neighbors were partial standing home losses from the 2017 wildfires in um, Sonoma uh, County in California. We also, as I mentioned, have our partners um, in uh, with Boulder County in the towns of Superior and Louisville um, and with the state agencies that are um, doing what they can to help. Um, just uh, the, the our experts tonight are volunteers. We can go to the next slide. Um, and uh, a lot of the, the experts that we bring on our programs are people who we have vetted in terms of their knowledge. Um, we don't have um, any kind of financial relationship with any of these experts tonight. They don't, they are not, uh, you won't find them in our fine help directory. Um, they are indoor air quality professionals, um, smoke um, and fire debris remediation professionals. Um, and uh, we brought them here tonight because of their knowledge base. Um, this program tonight we're offering is through our Roadmap to Recovery program. Um, but when we identify problems in a disaster area that can't be fixed on the ground, um, then through our advocacy and action program, we advance pro legislative proposals and different ways of are trying to address them. And on the question of getting insurers to do the right thing um, in terms of uh, evaluating, assessing, um, cleaning um, a, a, a home that's been exposed to wildfire, debris and smoke, um, from the very beginning, right after the fire in um, 
in late December, we were, I was on the phone with the insurance commissioner talking to him about the unique challenges that uh, people face when uh, their house is not gone, but is um, damaged and all the challenges that are pretty much chronic in the aftermath of disaster. So we're gonna be talking about those issues tonight. Um, I know Commissioner Conway has put out some bulletins to help you with the challenges that we know you're encountering, um, but whatever you know comes out of tonight, just know that um, we're just we're always working. Um, and if there are problems that can't be solved here um, and through the expertise of these people that we're bringing to you tonight, um, we will be um, addressing them however we can. Um, this is the first in a series. Um, I want to thank Laura Collins um, in your community who herself has had a loss, but has also um, kind of inspired us to get this program underway and has been a big help to us and is the person who runs the um, closed Facebook group that I think a lot of you are part of. Next slide, please. So that's our the link to the library that we have set up for your community. And you can see some links there. But for this, for your for your situation in particular, um, we do have some partial loss publications that hopefully you have um, already taken a look at. But our smoke restoration guide, we recently updated it based on some feedback that we got. Um, so that's there also to be a help to you. Uh, next slide. These are our upcoming events. You can see that um, the next the next uh, three uh, parts in this series of partial loss workshops will be on the 18th, the 24th, and the 25th of this month. Um, and then uh, <clears throat> we will be offering our normal survivor to survivor forums uh, coming up on the 3rd and 17th of May. Um, and then next Wednesday, uh, we will be offering a, um, a, a, a program on resilient rebuilding, which is Again, since you're partial loss folks, I think probably um, not something you're going to want to pay too much attention to, but you're welcome to to do, tune in for any of our programs um, and, and get um, information that we have curated for you. Next slide. Um, again, we, we really know um, where you are uh, because we have been doing this work for such a long time, and we know that no one would ever predict how challenging it is uh, to be impacted by a wildfire and have to pick the pieces back up. Um, and it is a process. And we know that the only way to get through a process, this process is one step at a time. Um, and so this is just a reminder of that. Next slide, please. Um, and we have to thank the Community Foundation of Boulder County. Um, had they not uh, funded us early, we wouldn't have been able to jump in as we did right away right after the fire, um, pulling together resources for you. Next slide, please. Um, so just a reminder that this workshop is intended to be general guidance, uh, not legal advice. Um, if you have a legal question, we recommend that you consult an experienced attorney. Uh, we've already done a couple of, um, of um, pro bono legal help clinics in your area. We'll be doing another one on June, uh, June 23rd. So if you feel like um, that you want to talk to a lawyer and, um, and you, you want to try somebody, um, a one hour limited free consult, um, you'll have an opportunity to sign up for that. Um, but although um, I'm just thrilled that we have the three experts with us tonight, um, and I have a lot of respect for their expertise, I want to remind you that they are not um, UP experts, they are their own experts, um, and they are here as a courtesy um, and uh, as volunteers uh, to help shed light on the challenges and, and problems that, that you're all looking to, to overcome. Next slide, please. Um, so I'm so pleased to be joined today uh, by Val Brown, as I introduced earlier, our, my Deputy Executive Director, Annie um, and then our volunteers, Dan Bolst Dawn Volstad Johnson with Kazen Safety Solutions. She's a certified industrial hygienist based in Arizona. We've got Janine Humphrey, a certified indoor air quality professional based in Colorado. Um, and then also Michael Richen. Am I pronouncing your name right, Michael? Richen, or is it Rick Richen. Yeah. Richen. And yeah. uh, Michael is with uh, Boulder County's Office of Public Health, and he is also an aide. So all three of them 
our industrial hygienists by training. So um, Michael, Janine, Dawn, thank you so much um, for being with us tonight. Um, and I'm gonna turn it over now to uh, my colleague Val Brown to take us through the substantive presentation. So um, uh, Val's got a uh, little bit of a frog in her voice. So I'm, gonna, I'm just gonna cover this slide and then I'll turn it over to you, Val. Um, so we're gonna be covering finding and vetting an industrial hygienist, working with and paying an industrial hygienist, report prep best practices, how to read your IH report, and then interpreting results into practical action for um, cleaning your home uh, and remediating the damage. Now, those of you who may have tuned in when the insurance commissioner did a program early on and, and I was on and we were talking about the order in which things should be cleaned, um, I'm sure this has been a journey from there to here for a lot of you and we are very familiar with the challenges um, that you are navigating. And so we have done our best to really um, pinpoint what those are in terms of um, how you find people you can trust, whether you can trust the people that your insurance company brings out, what kind of testing will make you feel comfortable, um, and, and, and at the end of the day, how you can get to a place where you feel confident that you can move back in uh, to your home and, it, and, and not get sick. Um, so now I'm gonna turn it over to Val. All right, thank you, Amy. My apologies for the froggy voice. Um, so we're gonna start with, uh, do you want me professional expert help? Um, and and the, the, the answer is, you know, these are, these are complex claims. Uh, the standards vary, uh, remediation methods vary widely. Um, and so you want that thorough evaluation and documentation uh, by in industry professionals so you can document the hidden or latent damages you've got. Um, and just a point here, captive experts hired and paid by the insurer, they're not independent. They may have a very limited scope of work um, and uh, there's limited regulatory help in this space. Um, and I'm gonna pass uh, just briefly to our uh, panelists. If there's anything here you'd like to speak to that. I know um, each of you have worked with those captive experts and um, uh, there, there might be something you wanna share here. You know, if I can just, before we do that, Val, I, I think I left something out, which is the elephant in the room, um, which is that uh, we know that your additional living expense coverage uh, is limited and that you um, that the clock is ticking and obviously you're, you would love to get back home, but you don't wanna move back home unless it's safe. Um, and the, the realities of the insurance claim process and the fact that insurers um, are always um, keeping their eye on costs a lot of you are sort of, we, we know this, between a rock and a hard place with how, how long do you hold out um, to, to get your insurer to do the right thing, even if it means running out of your ALE and how far do you have to take this fight? So we very much understand that that's where a lot of you are. Okay, now the, now the experts. Well, I would just like to chime in a bit. I think, I think if your house was charged with smoke for you know, days or weeks that you you should invest in a, uh, someone to come out and test, um, even if it's just a cursory test and and um, because the health of your family and is is you can't put a price tag on it. And so um, a lot of um, what I'm seeing in my practice is a lot of times insurance companies are telling you to get a Swiffer and quit whining and go back home. And um, and that's not, it's, it's not as simple as that. So um, I think, you know, do your homework, hire the right person, um, get your questions answered. And, um, you know, they should, whoever, if you do decide to hire someone, they should be working with you and explaining things along the way and why they're doing what they're doing, what testing, all that kind of stuff. So that they should be a partner with you, not just a kind of following the the gravy train on opportunity to make a lot of money consulting because there's there's that happening out there too definitely what don said and that they'll stand behind you with their report as well and they're not going to be pushed to the back burner they're going to stand up there with you and continue to fight with you and then michael anything to add i know um you you've suggested having the um uh your ih uh actually um show up when they uh, uh, when the insurance adjuster the, the captive expert shows up uh, that that would be a good idea if you could pull it off 
because uh, then they're going to recognize that you've, you've got an expert and and you're not going to be a pushover. Um, but uh, you're, you're limited to some degree in what, what the insurance companies um, uh, are going to allow. And I, you have to make your own decision if you're going to uh, get your independent expert. Uh, that is by far the best thing to do. Then they work just for you, not the insurance company. Um, and most of you guys are realizing, you know, insurance companies don't don't necessarily uh, uh, support you directly. I mean, they they have a they have other motivations. So you just got to keep that in mind. The other thing I just like to highlight quickly is that the wildfires we're seeing today are not Smokey the Bear fire. It's not like you got a little campfire smoke in your house you have all your neighbor's contents, everything that burned in the fire's path and was carried in that plume of smoke, which in some cases can move like a freight train, um, go through your house. So um, I believe that insurance companies are using an old model um, for maybe wildfires or brush fires where we didn't have the toxicity that we have today. Our, our furniture is made of plastic. We have a lot of plastic load in our home. And when you have a whole neighborhood go up, that toxicity just grows exponentially. So I believe the insurance companies are following an older model that's worked for years and it really hasn't caught up with how, I mean, think of your house 20 years ago, we didn't have flat screen TVs and all kinds of stuff that we have today. You know, our toasters were metal, they're plastic now. So just uh, think about the changes as we've evolved as consumers and, and the things we have in our homes compared to what was there 20 years ago, and then take it back another 20 years to the 70s where your, your furniture was wood, it was real wood, and, and your couches were stuffed with cotton. Um, you, you're not gonna find that anymore unless you go to high-end stores <laughs> to, or Amish to get real wood. So um, anyway, just I just wanna point that out that, you know, in defense, you know, and, and I just want to point out a per, another perspective, maybe that the insurance companies are looking. It's a model they followed forever, and so why change now, kind of thing. So, um, just some food for thought. Right, but you can see at the top of the screen here: Do I want or need? We know that for a lot of you, the question is: Well, the insurance company has brought somebody out, so I'm not paying that directly. Do I pay out of pocket? And I think you know we're going to be teasing that question out. Do you pay? And I think what what I hear, basically, I've heard all of these experts say, um, if you can, yes, you should. Right. Yeah, and, and the other thing, the other thing uh, Dawn alluded to, but uh, the fires that go through neighborhoods uh, and the burning, this is way hotter um, and intense and giving off a lot different pollutants, so. It, it, it's way different than just a, a fire itself when the whole neighborhood burns down. Like she said, you're you're subjected to the to the uh, the combustion products from from your neighbor's house uh, if your house survived, obviously. obviously and and it, it's 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 not the same. Well, and and again to point out what Mike said about the heat. Um, the old model is to look for soot, char, and ash in your home. That So if you don't have a lot of soot, they're like, your house is fine. Um, <laughs> wildfires don't generate a lot of soot. Soot is a product of incomplete combustion. And because the fire is burning so hot, you don't have a lot of soot. Um, I worked for Phoenix Fire for 19 years. Fire investigators look for soot patterns and arson fires because fires in a home, or if it's an arson or whatever, it starts smoldering. And that generates a lot of soot. And so that allows the fire investigator to look for cause and origin in a regular house fire. In a wildfire that is eating neighborhoods, there's not a lot of soot. So if, if the insurance company is saying, look, your soot's only 3% or 5%, you're fine. That's not the litmus test. So um, if that's all you know, you walk away with that you're ahead of the game here because the um, it, it shouldn't be the litmus test, but it has become the litmus test. And that's something I'm working on in my practice to get that paradigm shifted back to where it should be. 
Right. And that, that leads into this next point that your non-qualified certified adjuster says your home is perfectly safe, habitable, and requires only standard cleaning. They don't have the expertise to tell you that. So getting into when do you need testing, um, you know, if, if a non-qualified professional on there said your house is fine, you, you, you know, looking at uh, testing, if you've got a family member who has a medical condition that makes you particularly vulnerable uh, to exposure, um, you know, if you, uh, you, need, you, know, you need this uh, peace of mind, and as Michael said, you know, being close in that red zone from a fire in close proximity. And, and then and just getting into who does the testing. Yes, go on. Just a point, if, if anyone in your family is having health effects, please reach out to an industrial hygienist, a certified industrial hygienist to do that evaluation. People who are asthmatic, are asthmatic or have other respiratory chronic issues generally will feel health effects where the rest of us won't. So I would really pay attention to that if you have a child or I had a case where a mom and a son were having health effects, but the daughter and the dad were not. Um, and the mom was starting to feel like she was crazy and um, we found right. the source. So um, just just be aware of that. Don't discount um, any health effects that your family may be. You're, you're there 24 seven. That's supposed to be your safe place. So. Right. It, and and the, the whole population of people with any given population, there, there are quite a few people that are sensitive. Uh, that's something that's not generally recognized by everybody, even in the industrial hygiene profession. Um, so so uh, I, I think I can just I can just hear the, the, the voices out there saying, okay, okay, but IHs are in short supply in our area. Is there, is there a, um, a workaround here? If I can't find an IH, can I, is there another category of professional that, that I could, that could, could do some of this work? So if we could speak to that, that would be great. If the answer is no, the answer is no, right? You, that it's gotta be an IH, but what, what is the answer? It, you wanna handle that Dawn or I, I, I'm pretty sure uh, we, we have the same opinion on that. Yeah, I think, so. I think, I think when you're talking health effects, I would, get an IH. I mean, there are IHs that'll travel to Colorado. Yeah. I, I am in Arizona. I go all over the country. Right. Um, there's, so if there's shortages, you can reach out. You could also reach out um, via Zoom to get some advice, you know, that may help. Um, if it's not a health effect issue and you want to get some evaluation, there's, there's people like Janine who maybe wants to take it over and, um, She's kind of the exception to the rule as far as my experience goes with um, people who are certified in air quality, but I think she really knows yeah. her stuff. So um, you have to vet the people out as-, as Yeah, you know. and you know, one, one thing you can do is when you're vetting your professional is, um, you know, ask them for references, of course, but, you know, maybe ask them for a redacted report. Most people that are legitimate have no problem with that. Um, and, 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 in, and then you're going to get a good idea of the communication that goes on. I mean, I read a, a indoor air quality professional report. I think we were all looking at it and I think, I mean, no, no, it was another one other than that, that there was a disclaimer that said, you know, we're, we're, we are, we're not making any health related judgments. And really that's the purpose of what you want them to do in the first place. Right, so right. that's that's a real that's a real red flag if you ever see that in any written right. report. And we have a it, for a little further in the presentation, we do have a slide that uh, has questions to ask when you're vetting a professional. We'll talk about that in a little bit. But you know, Amy, to your question, you know, obviously the most qualified is the certified industrial hygienist, that indoor air quality professional. You want to make sure that somebody, you know. They, they have the credentials to deal with smoke. They have the experience, right? And they have very solid testing protocols in a chain. Um, you know, I don't want to make sure you all understand that even though a person's a CIH, they don't necessarily have experience in this area. Right. You know, ask them what a kind of experience. And if they don't, uh, a lot of them can collaborate with their fellow people and do a decent investigation, because um, uh, in every state there are people that, that, that do this and the smart people know they don't know everything. 
So mm-hmm. that, but that just be just ask those important specific experiences that they have in, in uh, indoor environment uh, uh, wildfire issues. I think I think Dawn um, made this point that um, that you know it's not enough to just to know mold and know how to test for mold. That the wildfire smoke is a very particular area that has been developing quickly in terms of the knowledge and understanding in the scientific community. And it's important to have somebody who's tapped into the current state of the problem. The other, I think that's great advice that Michael gave too about get a redacted report. That'll tell you. They'll tell you everything. Really. Yeah. Right. So you can read the disclaimers and if they say we don't do any health uh, recommendations, then, and, and you have health issues going on in yeah. your home, then you know, yeah. you, that's like the best tool right there. And, and Michael's right. If they're worth their, their weight, they're going to happily provide that. Yeah. Or they'll have a discussion that I don't do this a lot, but I can do this and this. I mean, you have to make a qualitative judgment yourself. Yeah. And you can compare their redacted sample against a sample that we have on our website that actually Dawn donated. This is a, you know, a, a, an example of a comp- comprehensive, thorough wildfire damage assessment. Yeah. And um, and then going back to this, where to find in the IH, you know, Dawn had mentioned that um, that many of them will travel, you know, um, word of mouth, online research. Just you, you can also you can also go to the local section of the American Industrial Hygiene Association. So California has one, uh, Colorado has one, um, um, Utah. I mean, or you can go uh, and then that registry aiha. dot org. You know, they have a listing of consultants. Uh, Again, they don't all have the fire experience, but uh, you can at least identify people that have certified industrial hygienists and, uh, uh, you know, make your judgments there. And, and that, that, that it has listings for, for all the states. And, and some remediation companies will have a recommendation of IHs they've worked with in the past. So, um, and then making your case and just you know, uh, you, you're choosing the testing, the testers, you're paying them yourself, ideally getting reimbursed to help ensure they're not captive. You want to make sure you get the reports. Um, they don't just go to your insurer because uh, you want to know what's being said about your home. Um, you know, be very clear, uh, keep your, make your request in clear language uh, using uh, policy and statutes to back you up, going up the chain of command in writing. Um, you know, if you need to, uh, filing that complaint with the division of insurance, um, you know, and then, and then documenting you know, the same stuff we're always telling people for claims. You want to make sure you're documenting um, uh, your interactions, your requests, and all of that. Um, and so this is one of the first questions. We, uh, this is question one. Uh, we t- took questions earlier before uh, for tonight's webinar. Um, and so where, uh, where do people get the unbiased protocols for mitigation? Um, and uh, I had two different people ask the question, what objective measures tests should be done prior to mitigation to determine what needs to be done for mit- remediation mit- mitigation? And then where can I get this scientific protocol and have the results interpreted for internal living spaces? There seems to be a lot of different opinions. So I'm gonna pass this over to our experts. Um, well, I'll take a stab, but I, I think, um, you know, soot, char, and ash seems to be the standard protocol that everybody's doing, and I, I don't really see how we can get around, you know, not doing that because that's what everybody's used to seeing. Um, you don't have to sample. My, my philosophy, and this is mine, so there is no standard, by the way, on safe levels of soot, char, or ash. Some people will say, well, if you have 1% soot, char, and ash, that's because you burn candles in your house and that's normal background. There is no such standard um, exists. Those are labs that are posting that stuff. And it's really a conflict of interest for a lab to weigh in on interpreting results. The professional collecting the sample is supposed to interpret the results. The lab's just supposed to analyze the sample. So um, so char and ash, you don't need to do every room. I think if you get a positive hit, you're, you're in, you know, it's a, it's like, you can't be a little bit pregnant. You're either pregnant or you're not pregnant. And, 
And so I think if you have a positive hit on soot char and ash, you're in the path of the, the fire smoke. I don't think you need to do 50 samples. I think you can get by with five or 10. Yes. Um, the other thing is, is I would do airborne particulate counts. I'm a, I'm, um, I've been an industrial hygienist for over 30 years. I am um, uh, real-time detection. I love real-time detection because it tells you on the fly while I'm on site, whether you got a problem or not. So um, indoor air, and you can get particle counters on Amazon. I don't really recommend it. Um, the, you know, an average uh, industrial hygiene level meter probably will cost between five and 7,000 or maybe five and 9,000, I can't remember, but it has six channels on it and you measure outside air and you compare the outside counts to your inside counts. Um, in theory, outside air should be dirtier than inside air. And the reason is, is because we're in a built environment and we have filters. We have HVAC systems and we have filters that are filtering out stuff out of the air. So equal to outside is okay. When what I'm seeing in my practice is people have powers of 10 higher inside. So outside is, you know, 10 parts, uh, 10 counts of 10 micron and I go in the house and it's 3000 or I, I, I sample outside and it's 30,000 and I go inside and it's 3 million in the house. And I'm not making up those numbers. Those are real. Well, and we have a, we have a real example of that to show and a little yeah. further on. Yeah. But I can ask a quick question, Dawn, because my understanding from the, you know, the beginning of all this mess is that one of the, the problems is that the stand, there, there isn't a, a published official adopted standard for acceptable um, air quality after a wildfire. But then I understand we're like a year away from having that standard be inked. Is that right? Well, I'm not sure what entity is putting it out, but I'm also working on pushing something through AIHA to the American Industrial Hygiene Association because it's confusing. It's like the wild, wild west, like cowboy town. You know, everybody's, I think, you know, for the most part, I think everybody's trying to do the right thing. It's just the right thing hasn't been defined. And so, um, you know, you go to this one lab and and again, if you're like a, um, you hire somebody who's used to doing mold. Well, the analysis for soot, char, and ash isn't that different than it is for mold. They're using a polarized light. Um, it's polarized light microscopy, essentially. And so the mold labs can easily shift and start analyzing soot, char, and ash. So that's good news, right? Well, then all the mold people just say, okay, well, just ask the lab, what does this mean? 3%, 5%. And now the lab has established these boundaries like you know one percent is normal three percent is medium normal and over ten percent is a problem but the thing is is you have to remember there's not a lot of soot in wildfire because it burns so hot so if we're using soot as a litmus test we're missing the whole boat here um you know pay attention to the char levels too that's just as important so soot char and ash um, you shouldn't have high concentrations in your house. Um, but the particulate count um, really tells a story, especially if the house is vacant. Um, it, that smoke is particulate, essentially. And on that particulate, it carries acid gases, it carries VOCs, it gets into your, your wall cavities and your attic, it comes in through all the creeks and cracks and crevices of your house, through your chimney and under doors, under, you know, it, so, um, you know, just again, um, I think you can do a lot more testing, but the cheapest, most effective, I think is the, you know, doing a couple swabs for soot char ash because that's the model that we follow and, and then getting the airborne particulate. If, if the airborne particulate is high and you're having health effects or somebody in your family is having health effects, then I would move to doing gas detection um, but you have to make sure that the gas meters that you're using include formaldehyde. Um, formaldehyde is a big player, especially when homes burn, especially if they're made out of oriented strand board. Um, there's a lot of formaldehyde released um, in those events. So please, um, I would look for the carcinogens. You know, don't look for the exotic stuff that sounds really nasty. I would look for the carcinogens um, because that's your your living space. And I would wanna know that before I moved back in. So 
there are levels of investigation, I guess, is what I'm trying to convey. Um, and of course, you get what you pay for. So um, the cheapest way is soot char and ash with maybe particulate counting. And then it kind of the price kind of goes up from there um, as far as doing a complete evaluation. And, and Michael had made that shared a point that, that we talked about earlier. You know, a lot of this is just uh, observation when you come into a home to see what needs to be done. Well, that, that, so that might be a segue, maybe not, but I really think that a good report always has observations and uh, sometimes industrial hygiene, it may seem like a little overbearing, but those are good, that's good information too. Does, the, does each room smell, you know? And you, you can maybe not quantify it easily, but you can certainly say, the odor is much stronger here than other places. You can you can make the notations about you know observations on how intact uh, the windows and the walls, exterior walls are from the outside, um, and then going inside, you know there can be observations of you know do I see a lot of settled dust that shouldn't be in a house you know, uh, and I think the uh, uh, that's, that's as important because it puts everything in perspective so you can have some idea of what, what does that really mean? You know, and it gets a little bit more at the bigger picture and then the, all those sample results are gonna add to that picture and make right. it. And, and, and yes, sampling and getting some results of carcinogens is, is, that's a good thing to look for because you know, we all have a low risk tolerance for that, but uh, we should uh, uh, know it's gonna have a big impact on the insurer. They, they, don't, yeah. they don't want to see that in a report and then deny that, you know, that happened. So that's, that's, a, that, that's an important thing that, that Don said. Yeah, and, we'll, and we'll, we'll, we'll touch on that again. Uh, question two, what's the difference in the risk now versus when the fire happened? Um, from these hazards, right? You know, because uh, people are concerned about when the winds pick up in the area, is it blowing the same level of toxins into the home? Is, you know, or is that risk different, um, you know, now that the fire's out and we're just dealing with debris outside? Well, I would say it's, it is different because um, the gases that were in all that smoke have probably volatized away, volatiles volatize, um, that's what they do. Um, the, the thing is, is that they hang out in your house because your house is like a closed box. Um, so it can get into little nooks and crannies and corners and, and kind of um, the, you know, and I, and I did this research with the fire investigators. The fire investigators have huge exposures as they disturb the debris pile, they're releasing pockets of gas. So, um, you know, there, there could be pockets of gas and, and, you know, but the, what I've been seeing is homes are just leveled. There, there isn't even a frame left. Um, I wouldn't worry about if the concern is about the dust and what's blowing around on the dust. Um, I would, I would put that as a, a low risk. I don't know, if Michael or Janine. Um, well, I, I, think, I, I, I uh, just to be sure what we're talking about. So out those outside dusts are probably have been off gassed. Yes. But on the other hand, most people will open their windows to ventilate their house. So, you know, if you live in a neighborhood where there's very few houses left and there's a lot of disturbed soils that are not covered with plants, then you don't want those in your house. It's not gonna be as bad as a fire, of course, for, for the, because they off gas, they were subjected to rain, they were compacted. Um, um, and the other thing is they, they have a tendency to stick together. So their particle sizes are bigger. Particle size is important because lower particle sizes get in your lower lung. So, um, but I think the dust in your, the particles that Dawn is talking about in your house, and, and she can talk in detail. I, I, I found your report, Dawn, and that I, it was a really good report. But um, the, uh, uh, there's a lot of particles that, that uh, surprisingly are there and floating around all the time. Simply walking through an area, you, you kind of lift dust from the floor and it comes up 
into your breathing zone, and et cetera. That, and, or, and or the wind might blow on the outside of your house and some of the particles that got trapped in interior walls or the attic space or wherever are being blown into your living space. So if they're still present in great numbers, that's a, that's a concern. Well, hey, that's I, a different, that's a different. I, I, is a, can I we get from Janine, who's got a bunch of clients in the area um, and Janine with, with, as far as this question, do you have anything to share? I do. So I've been witnessing a lot of the excavation that's been taking place and things like that. And people get making their way back into their home post remediation. Um, I think follow up you know, procedures that we're going to kind of talk about later on, ensuring that you are doing certain things in your home to maintain that clean space as much as you can without having it recontaminated is going to be important. High wind days, not opening your windows. If you're in a major burn zone, not opening your windows, cleaning that up as it's coming in, vacuuming. Um, you know, if having, you notice excavation rug. taking place without wetting down, yeah. call that in. Because, you know, while, like Don said and Michael said, it's off gas for the majority of it, you still don't want those particulates in your house blowing around and making their way into nooks and crannies and hiding out there and, you know, affecting everybody's sensitivity levels are different. While you may not have a sensitivity to it, it's not to say somebody else may not. Um, just taking those precautions and making sure that you're trying to keep it as clean as possible is going to be important. It's going to be around for yeah, a while. I mean, they've only begun excavation behind Costco so far, and there's a lot more to go. Right, and there there's some private houses that are yes. being done too. So a little bit of talk about there's there's a bunch of houses that the county's remediating that that people have opted in, and there's a number of people that, that have opted out and are doing their own cleaning, hopefully with a legitimate contractor, but they're all supposed to have building permits. Mm -hmm. And so, so if you see people not using water suppression techniques, um, then, then you, you uh, like spraying a hose when you're dumping something into the back of a truck, that's a point that needs to be misted. Um, um, the soil should be misted before it's even dug to some degree. Uh, Michael, if people opted out and they've now wished they hadn't and they want to come back and enjoy it, can they join? But just call the county. Just call the county and ask. I'm pretty, I, I don't know for sure, but I'm, I'm pretty sure the, the kind of people they are, they'll, they'll figure it out with you. I'm, I'm pretty sure that's the case. I guess I could follow up on that and get back. Yeah, so if, any, if anyone's concerned about their, you know, neighbors wanting to get into the debris removal right, program, right. yeah, we can, we can right. pull them. Right, but uh, you need, yeah, but do complain when you see people yes. not not using dust suppression techniques. Call, um, call the city. Call the city building department. You can call public health. You know, we have a role with the state air quality uh, people. Uh, we work on contract with them. You know, we can we can do some enforcement too. Um, and uh, I committed in our last talk that I would make sure that our, our uh, outside air people at public health um, um, are, have a list of all the properties and you know have, have kind of an idea. And then when they get complaints, they'll be more prepared uh, to go out there. So the town of Superior is requesting that people ask the city, when you call, you ask the city to send the debris inspector out. Okay. Uh, Louisville okay. should have one too, but there should be an inspector that will go out and it's usually same day to go. Yeah, in, to be do any good, it's gotta be that. Yes, day. to let put a stop to that or put them on hold until they have a water truck or they have something there to be able to do it correctly. Right. And we and we do have that noted later in the, in the deck of, uh, okay. on a checklist of things for people to... Uh, in, in doing your remediation. Uh, question three is it really, it's just what's the deal with soft goods? Um, you know, uh, people are all having this issue. One adjuster will say, do whatever's needed. Another one denies everything uh, to houses that are often side by side, you know, not willing to replace any soft goods, wants to clean everything. 
you know, what's safe, what, 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 what needs to be tossed, um, you know, what, what, what do people do with this? Because it's, it's causing a lot of confusion. So my advice would be to get rid of all your soft goods, get rid of your mattress, get rid of your pillows, get rid of your upholstered furniture. Um, it's it's going to continue to off gas that smoke has infiltrated everything. So um, I don't see a logical way of getting it out. And I've asked this question too. Why are some insurance companies allowing it and some are not? Mm -hmm. And it's because there's no uniform approach to this. And just because one insurance company says, get rid of all your soft goods, if you're, you know, and that's your neighbor's house and your insurance company is saying, clean it, take it to the dry cleaners or, you know, wet vac it or whatever, you can't get into the all, all the layers of that yeah. foam that's in your mattress or in your, um, your soft goods. And they, you know, from a health and safety perspective, I would just get rid of it. I had a client that wanted to go get her wedding dress out of her house and her house, it was a paradise fire. And, um, I said, you need to take pictures and leave the, the wedding dress there because now you're bringing the contamination with you into your new living space. So be very careful about, I had another client whose child, their favorite stuffed animal, you know, they cleaned it and, and we tested it after they cleaned it and it didn't resolve. And that was heartbreaking for the little six-year-old. <laughs> Yeah, I just I feel like I need to just throw this in that you know there may be a lot of people who are dialed in tonight that are going, wow, this is really different from what the um, remediation company is, has been telling me that the insurance company brought and they they took a bunch of my stuff out and they you know the, the Serve Pro or what have you and they they cleaned it and, and then they brought it back or what have you so. So just, you know, Janine, again, I mean, just again, just because you're local there and working with people, um, I, I mean, are you on the same page that all soft goods have to be tossed no matter what? Especially or when you're in closer proximity to the burn zones and where total homes are, where homes are a total loss. Um, it has definitely been a very, very hard battle for a lot of people, for most people in the area to to even get that. Um, some of them have to go through and they have to do the cleaning because insurance is like, well, we're not going to do anything until you do clean it. And then you test it afterwards to prove well, otherwise uh, yeah. is, is what a lot of it is. I mean, mattresses, when you think about mattresses, pillows, furniture, when we sit down on that, the gases, whether they're VOCs, they're semi-volatile, um, whatever it is inside of there, we're essentially ingesting that in, we're absorbing it into our skin, which is not good for anybody because it can have health effects down the road. Um, you know, that is something that I do recommend for everyone. If we can't go that route, and I know not everyone agrees with the dioxin furin testing because there's not a lot of data on it and research, but there is studies that do show, um, you know, through EPA and through other areas that it can be a concern when produced through combustion. Um, right. So it, it can be some testing that is recommended if you're having trouble doing that. Typically, I like to go in, do that visual inspection. Um, a lot of times I recommend it if it becomes a battle, I throw it in my report and I attach references. Here's why health effects that can be caused from this, yeah. um, things like that. Okay, so are all three of you in agreement? All three of our experts are not, in agreement? Not exactly. I, I think it really depends on how much smoke was in the house. Definitely. Um, and so I, I, before this freight train leaves, and everybody comes, <laughs> that, that that was recommended. I think it really depends. The concepts that both uh, Janine and Dawn express, I agree with, uh, but it depends on the degree. Uh, in most cases, you can clean your clothes in your own washing machine because you're, I'm talking about people whose houses are pretty much, or for the most part intact, and they have things like washing machines. They can wipe, wipe down uh, hard surfaces. Uh, hard, hard surfaces. A hard, definitely. like say you had, you had some kind of a, a, a hard wood product. You can wipe it down. You can clean it. You can clean the surface, but you can't clean 
uh, entirely very well uh, a couch. You yes. can't very well clean a rug. And uh, there's one other factor you got to consider with rugs, because I talk to people about this all the time. You know, I first ask them how old the rug is. You know, if it's got 10 years on it, I mean, you know, maybe just get, get rid of it. It's probably got a lot of dust adhered to it. And mm -hmm. you're, you're going to be very hard to clean a rug. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, the, the kinds of rugs that have jute backing, that's the kind I'm talking about. They're, they're composite products and they're hard to clean. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so if, it, if it had a light dusting, you might be able to, you know, vacuum it, extract, clean it. But uh, uh, a lot of people, when they do the pre post tests on those, um, you know, you do a little vacuum test and you find things, you know, uh, that they, they need to be disposed of. But so, uh, so we don't have a hard and fast rule here that no, well, you're going to get a lot of yeah. clothing. I've tested clothing post remediation yeah. and cleaning, and it has been shown that the clothing, some materials of clothing can be cleaned. Right. Um, right. You know, couches, mattresses, things like that. On the toxic equivalent yeah. quantity but, scale, it has gone down. Right. Not a drastic amount, again, right. because of the foam but, and how but, uh, thick it is. A wedding dress is, a, is actually a pretty complex garment. It's got different layers. It's yeah. very hard to clean. It may not. I mean, uh, it, I, Dawn knows about the the, the firefighter testing with with, it, with people sent out their their bunker gear to get cleaned and they wash it. I don't know five to a number of times, and then they do some some extractive testing. Uh, some of the companies that clean those things, but uh, um, for the most part, clean what you can. And um, if even if the, uh, the a couch, I agree, a rug, even a new rug, if it has a significant about amount of, of, of dust from the fire, you ain't going to get it cleaned. Uh, the, the dust kind of works its way through the carpet. And magically, okay. yeah. So you, you, anybody that's replaced their carpet knows this. And that's a normal instance. This is abnormal. Well, it's well what I you, think, oh, go ahead. I was going to say, it's what you can see in your window sills when you have that significant amount come in or in your entry points in your home. That's what you can see. Just imagine what you can't see. In, in the inner wall space, yes. Exactly, inner wall space or, you know, what dropped and was heavy landed on the carpet, made its way in. Right. You know, a lot of people have furniture that sit in front of windows. Most beds, when you go into houses, they're in front of windows. Yeah. Um, when you think about all of that that came in and you see it, yeah. there's a lot that you yeah. do you, not see. You, you may have a, a throw over the uh, over the bed, and that's mm -hmm. a, another complex garment, uh, hard to clean thoroughly, uh, and it depends on how bad it was to start with. That well, may not be. Whereas, yeah. the, whereas the bedding underneath might be able to be washed. That that's just an example. So this goes back to the on-site inspection too. Yeah, because yeah, the, that's, the lady yeah. who's had the wedding dress that I told her to throw away, yeah. her house was across the street from a home pesticide applic uh, company. The guy had totes of pesticides in his front yard and they all melted and burned in the fire. So that's why I do agree with clothing that it could be cleaned, I'd recommend soap and water in a washing machine over dry cleaning. Yes. Um, so I do believe in that, yes. but, but you have to take it in the context. Each one, each one of your cases, each one of your exposures is a little bit different. You, you can't put a blanket on everybody's house and treat them all the same. The other thing is, is the airborne particulate counts um, are gonna tell you how much smoke got in the in your house. And I don't think it's so much how much as it more as it is how long. Um, because if you're evacuated for a week and your house was charged with smoke for a week, um, that smoke had a chance to get literally everywhere, like yeah. in every nook and cranny. And it's it's gonna stay in there until you get all the contamination out. So I think um, 
you know, as, as much as I know everybody would like to hear a blanket statement, it, it really depends on the context. And that's why an on-site investigation is so important. And looking at the observations, like Janine said, about what's collecting in the windows and doors, because that's obvious. The particulate counting that I'm talking about is in the rooms that you're living in, and you can't see it with the naked eye. So um, anyway, just, just a lot of food for thought. I know this is a lot of information, but try to just you know, take it in bite-sized pieces because at the end of the day, I think all of us want you to have healthy, you know, continue to have healthy lives and not have the, uh, you know, the after effects of, of the fire in your home to, to get you sick down the road when, when now you can't connect the dots anymore because too much time has passed. So, yeah. So we, John, we did uh, have a Tesla factory that started on fire too in the area hotel you know, those bigger things, um, some homes that did have solar panels, those kind of things that come into play, those are questions that get asked as well. And also, you know, driving around when you look at the area, when you're getting ready to do the visual inspection, you look at those things and what can you see what's left behind of the burn? Because there's going to be certain things that are not going to combust all the way that can be indicative to what type of chemicals were released and produced in that area. So let's let's get we want to try to, you know, give people as much kind of really pragmatic um, action steps, because I think a lot of people are mired right They're 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 in a situation with an adjuster where or the insurer has said this is our guy or this is our gal. Take it or leave it. Um, so labs, let's just talk about that for a minute, because um, you know, we, I think people know now that, you know, they've heard us say this from the very beginning, that if the insurance adjuster, they don't have the qualifications, they're, they're, then they, they cannot opine or they should not opine. They may, even though they, they, they don't have the qualifications that they may, but if they bring somebody with them, that generally means they have a relationship with that, that expert. The insurance companies typically do often have, um, they have, uh, cleaning services that they have regular relationships with. They have labs that some people would describe as being sort of in their pocket. So um, what, uh, like, I think there is even some insurers that, that, that may have a, even either own a lab, a testing lab, or um, have an interest in them financially. So, so why does it matter what labs um, the person uses that your, if your insurer has brought an IH, why does it matter what lab they use? And how can a person who's a lay person know whether or not that person can be trusted um, aside from the fact that they came from the insurance with the insurance company? I think that kind of goes back to what Don said that people who labs who do mold testing can easily switch over to combustion, which is great. But if they don't know what they're looking at or what levels or concentration or have no kind of experience in that, then they're just going off of information that they've learned or comparing it to things like mold and we're not looking at mold. So it's important to look at those labs and do they have experience in this? Is that what they do? Yeah. What, one thing that industrial hygienists do, um, they look at the or they, they find out the lab credentials. They discuss what they're gonna do with the lab before they even go out to make sure, you know, that they're not gonna have a miss, it's gonna have a miss there in how they collected the sample. And, and lastly, they will know which labs um, are, are, are not in the pocket, so to speak. Right. Well, Dawn, I mean, you do expert witness work in litigation. So there's got to be the insurance companies probably put experts up against you that are that that use different labs. Right. So are you kind of familiar with which labs you can, you know, or um, are play ball with insurance companies and give them the results they think they're looking for? Uh, I don't I don't know that that's the case so much. Um, there are mom and pop labs that are not certified that pop up out of the woodwork. I've seen that. But what I look for is a AIHA accredited lab because they have to, that's non-biased, it's non whatever, they can't be bought off. They have to have accreditation for what they're doing and their accreditation gets vetted through the AIHA. And you can go to the AIHA website or, or type in uh, Google AIHA lab accreditation and you can type in the name of the lab and the city where they're operating and see if they're, they're certified or not. Um, the lab, ironically, the lab that's putting out all this stuff about 1% soot is normal background and 5% is medium background or however their categories go, 
they are not, they are AIHA certified for mold only. They are not AIH, AIHA certified for polarized light microscopy, which is also used for asbestos. So um, that's not something that I would think the homeowner should be, you know, have to do. Um, but again, you can vet that out with whoever you're hiring. Um, what lab are you using? Are they AIHA accredited? Um, any lab that's worth its weight will be AIHA accredited. So um, that's really important to you. There, there's an article that everybody's following called the ABCs of wildfire testing. And it's really a commercial for two labs. And all the people are using those two labs for wildfire testing. And, and um, it, it's, you know, I, I don't know why, because maybe it, because of the article. Um, but when you look take a deeper look one of the labs is the lab that i just mentioned that um, has set the standard for soot the other lab is looking for fire indicators for wildfire and then they'll say well you only have one indicator so you're fine that the person who developed that indicators for wildfire were trying to find things that were unique to wildfire that couldn't be caused from having candles in your house or anything else but where, where the missing link is, is, is this individual is talking about Smokey the Bear fires, where it's just trees and brush. They weren't addressing the urban wildfire that just ate a whole neighborhood. So now you have consultants that are sampling for these wildfire indicators. And, and so it's not the insurance company that's buying the lab. It's the insurance company that's buying the consultant, if that makes sense. That so makes there's, sense. A, there's a lot of work. Um, and I don't work for insurance companies because ethically, I, I just don't think I can. Um, they, they want the answer that they want and then they'll get the answer through using these labs or, um, you know, and it's not that the lab isn't accredited. It's not that it, it's the wrong test. It's like sampling for lead in your blood and you're pregnant. You should be doing a pregnancy test, not a, you know, lead in your, you know, it's, it's just, it's so, disconnected. And, and so again, it goes back to vetting the person that you hire to do the work so that they can, because as a professional, I fired a lab I was using that I love the people I've known them for 20 years, they're an asbestos lab, and they kind of morphed into mold, and then they kind of morphed into soot charn ash, and they're quality, quality work. But um, the secretary or the receptionist said, because I was finding mistakes, I was finding mistakes in the lab report that you know, one lab, one time I took a sample in and it was, or a sample set and it was high and opaque um, particles. And the next time it wasn't. And I said, what is going on? And they go, well, we don't really do that many soot samples. So I'm like, you know what? I'm not using you anymore because these are my clients. And if you're not doing that, then, and they're AIHA accredited. I know the people I've known them for 20 years. I fired the lab. I mean, I don't think they know I fired them. I just started using a different lab for that was more qualified in such charn ash. So um, your professional should be continuously vetting that out. Um, yeah. and I, I think it comes back to, I want to touch on that. It comes back to also your, your person, your IH or whoever you're working with, not relying on the lab to provide those conclusions to you. That is up to the person that you are right. working with to interpret those results to you and break right. it down like, what is this what does this mean why am i seeing this what does the blank mean what does this mean there they should be able to break that down and help you understand what you are looking at without a lab writing on there what you're looking at right which is why we have the guidance providing a sample report so you can benchmark it against a quality one um, as Michael had mentioned earlier, you know, what is that sampling plan? What's the approach they take? All of these things feed into um, vetting professional help that is, is going to help you truly identify what needs to be done. Right. And, and, and just remember, you know, the good, the experienced industrial hygienist uh, knows the value of submitting blank samples. Yes. Uh, and these are little things that you're not going to know. As a cut, as a, and they're going to know. What does that mean? What is a blank? What, what 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 Dawn is saying? Some some labs are actually better, much better, uh, at at doing these visible microscope uh, evaluations than others, and uh, the hygienist is going to 
going to look at their work. I mean, we all look at their their uh, QC, QA, QC samples, which is supposed to be on <clears throat> every report to, to make sure there isn't something funky about the results before we start, you know, analyzing the results uh, uh, and making sure the calculations are right and, and et cetera. So there's more than just collecting the sample if it's submitted to the lab, uh, way more. And the other thing is- good. It, and the testing at the, by the lab has to be good, both things, the sample yeah. that's taken and the lab. Right, right. And, and it, it's kind of absurd to think that a lab would tell you what it means because they never took the sample. They don't know firsthand what you did. That's ridiculous. They should never do that. Yeah, right. and they don't know the context or the right. visual right. observations that you saw. Right, right. But th yep. that's what happens when you get a professional. Right. When they <laughs> use a lab, they pick the right one and it, and even if they had the right one, they're going to check their QC to make sure that report isn't funky, you know, which we've all found before. All of us that practice industrial hygiene, you know, some results are, are weird. And you talk to Liz, what did you do here? You know, to find out. Anyway, that. So, so, so just to wrap up the, on this section, that the, 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 you don't have to, as a homeowner, necessarily have do two vetting processes, vet your IH and vet the lab. That no. You got to vet the IH and, make, and 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 just now that you've you've had a conversation, you have a feel for why it matters what kind of lab they're using. I have had clients before using me ask, "What labs do you use? Can you provide me a sample copy of the COC? What does it look like? What does your redacted report look like?" And I have sent that stuff over because if you huh. are a good IH or if you are a good inspector, you have no problem providing that to a client and saying. Here oh. is what I do. Here is my certifications. Here is what you're going to get from me, right. because you're confident in what you're doing and what labs you're using and how you're going about this process to provide them something that they are going to be able to take to their adjuster or possibly even take to court at some point and have to get up and testify and stand behind your report right. and what you did. And if that person cannot provide that to you or is not willing to stand behind you for that, they're not the one for you. Okay. And then let's uh, just jumping on, on hiring, hiring an IH, uh, generally hourly rates, uh, uh, you know, you want to include particulate testing if you can, because uh, you, the insurance company, while they might want the sit char and ask, you know, you want the big picture, um, you want to identify what testing uh, is needed. Um, one thing to call out on the, the, uh, the VOC testing is um, if they're quoting occupational standards, um, those are based on eight hours a day, no more than 40 hours a week. As a homeowner, you've got a 24 seven exposure. So if you're, if you're only getting a test for two hours, just be aware it's not representative of what your actual exposure is in the home. We wanted to call that out. Um, and, and then go into how to read your report and, and just, um, uh, the, most of the samples we're sharing here are uh, Marshall Fire samples, and um, I'm going to call out some of the some of the ways these are problematic. The ones that the examples we've got, um, the, the the good and the bad on these. So I'm going to start with the wildfire smoke and all. And I know you had started earlier on smoke particulates. Um, anything to add to this before I jump into the uh, the other information? I just would like to give people a visual for how small this stuff is. So if you take a piece of hair out of your head and don't like look at the length, but look at the diameter of the hair. So, you know, the shaft, um, that is anywhere from 75 to hundred microns. So when we're talking about 10 micron size particulate, which is like a boulder in the particulate world, you can't see with the naked eye. Cause if you take a piece of hair and divide it into 10 pieces, you, it's no longer visible. So um, I just want to point that out. The dust that you see, we all see in our homes by the window as the sun is rising or the sun is setting. Those particulates are in your house all the time. That's normal house dust. We can't see them except by the window. So we think the window's leaking. It's really everywhere. It's the refractive light that's allowing us to see it at certain times of the day. 
So um, it's normal to have particulate in your house. You're never going to get rid of all the particulate. We slough off skin cells and, and, you know, cooking generates particulate and all that. It's really the difference between inside and outside. But I wanted to point out that it's not like you're going to be able to see raining dust or anything. It's all invisible to the naked eye. Thank you. All right. And then what else is there? Um, I know we've talked about the smoke residual. Uh, you know, the particulates are settling on the surface after the smoke dissipates. Um, Dawn, I've got your guidance in here about finding those larger particulate concentrations. Um, we've got our um, VOCs, um, the, the chemicals that you guys had mentioned earlier to look out for, benzene and the aldehydes. Um, and then this is all information from uh, Patrick Moffat, uh, his wildfire glossary of terms and definitions. Well, and, and I would just like to highlight that VOC testing, like if people are bringing SUMA canisters out to test your house, it doesn't pick up formaldehyde. And formaldehyde is one of the most pervasive chemicals out there. So they could do a SUMA canister, which may be dictated by the insurance company because they can get a, a, a negative result. Um, be careful of that. Uh, I would also ask for aldehyde test, whether it's a badge or um, I use direct read but my instrument is very expensive to use, um, but you do get results on, on site. So um, there are a lot of ways to collect uh, aldehyde sampling. Some are, are reasonable in price and others you know, are, are more expensive. So, but I would make sure you include something that has formaldehyde and glutaraldehyde in that array of sampling if you're going down that road. And, and then again, this goes back into starting with the observation when you get there, what's around, what the proximity is, um, and, before you, and before you're determining what testing needs to be done. Um, and then particulate matter, these are just some definitions uh, that we wanted to flag for you, knowing that lingo. Uh, let's see, this is an example of a report for soot, char, and ash. Anything you guys wanna share on this one? I just, I would just like to share this is pretty typical of what I see post fire in a wildfire situation. And uh, a lot of times people discount it, say, well, 5%, it's not that bad. 5% char. 5% is high. Um, it is high. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, um, Thank you. Because I think you make the point later, there are no safe levels of soot, char, and ash. Because there yeah. are no standards and there are no safe levels. No. And I, yeah, and and I, I think I, I think Dawn made the point that presence or absence is what you're really looking for. I mean, you do you get get a little bit of information from from the uh, results here, but the pre, the, the fact that there's char present in every sample that's pretty significant. Yes, and I I agree with that. I think for me what. I I do is more composition testing. So I yeah. will include, you know, a few different areas and take that and divide that. Um, even in my home here in Broomfield, uh, when I'm a good almost four miles away from the closest burn zone, I had the presence of char less than 1% on my walls in my home. I think that trying to get it down to nothing in these homes and bring remediation companies back in is going to continue to be a battle. And as long as your VOCs, your particulate matter, things like that are looking good, you know, char will continue to diminish over time. We do know that. Soot being present, no go. We know that. Um, but going in and, and cleaning those things or saying, you know, kids' toys that are plastic, definitely not something you want to keep, especially if char is present on those kids' toys post remediation because kids' habits, putting them in their mouth. Uh, touching books and then putting hands in their mouth, things like that. So it's been hard to get it down, being boots on the ground, it's been hard to get that down to nothing um, for any home. And I've tested, I would say 200 homes, maybe even more. And I have not had one where post remediation, it has been everything non-detect. And when you even go back, my level is 3%. Remediation companies hate me. I don't really care. Um, that's not okay. You can get it down lower than that. Go back, clean again. It can happen. Um, 
they, they push back on even that. And it's hard to get that to do. And with people wanting to get back into their homes, um, you know, we try to find that, that ground where based on other testing, can we determine whether or not going back home based on this, you know, what's a, what's a safe level essentially. Um, I know there's no safe level, but just my take on it. There's another great example of how there are no regulations. So Correct. Um, some people don't even do post remediation sampling. So um, Janine's probably ahead of the game on that one, but the clearance levels have not been determined. They so. have not. And I'm waiting for IICRC. I know they're currently in the process of putting out standards, protocols, and things like that. I'm, I'm really excited to see what that is going to look like and what that's going to entail because I'm hoping that going forward, you know, it provides answers for everyone on what do I do going in? What is the kind of testing? What do I need to do post remediation? Um, things like that to ensure that my home is safe and that I'm not taking my family back into a toxigenic waste dump. Yeah. Well, the IICRC is what I was referring to earlier when we were told that they're about a year away. Yeah. So they are in the process of that. I, I've been, that's one of the things that I, I stay on top of. We hold that for mold, which is a completely separate thing. Um, but I, I CRC protocols, they, I tend to like them. I don't know how Don and Michael feel about them, but um, it's a company or it's a regulation and standard that I choose for you know, follow it, it's on. not it's not a regulation in the sense that, no. that a county or city adopted it. It's a it's a protocol or guideline. Protocol, yep. And then they, they give you that mind map and how you're supposed to approach your inspection, mm -hmm. which is probably a. I'm more that kind of person. The process, and so you don't forget to do something. You have a certain process, yeah. and how you how you uh, do a certain job. And welfare is is way different. Let me let me move us on to our um, uh, one of the other reports. A lot of people have gotten surface dioxin and furin, and and just briefly can um, uh, you, uh, you uh, just give a what people should be worried or not worried about with this? Well, yeah, I think we talked about this slide, and. You know, the presence of these things are important, but I think presence or absence, but I think it's picograms per gram. And yes. so I, it's hard to correl correlate this into a recommendation or what the risk is, um, not knowing, you see, does it tell you? And yeah, it's picograms. Fiber and yes. dust. Yeah, I don't know what the context is, but uh, um, I, would, I wouldn't pay for this just as, as the standard. I mean, you got to start from general to specific. The, by far the most important thing is, is that consultant independently providing observations firsthand in the report and then when they explain, they might do a test like this, but for example, suppose you had a hard case where the, the insurance company wasn't going to replace your carpet. You know, you might do some kind of mm -hmm. uh, vacuum sample of a rug, for example, and then do this mm -hmm. kind of thing to show them, no, it's still there. It's been clean. I know it has been clean, but the stuff that's bad for you is still there. So well, this, not, yeah, I, I don't know. We, Dawn, you may have a different spin on this. I no, I agree with you, Michael. There should be a specific reason why you're doing this testing, not just because oh, it sounds really bad, and I should right. get my house tested for that too. I I think the particulate counts in your house are you know because this stuff could be on the particulate. So let's go the cheapest way first mm -hmm. and and see what we have. Um, if your right. people are getting sick and you think it could be related, there's dioxins in our food chain. So right. let's not forget about all the sources where this stuff could be coming from. Right. Um, 
and okay. just get it into context. So oh. understand why you're taking the sample number one and why you need to pay for it um, and why the insurance company is or isn't paying for it and why you want it. So if you have a consultant that's directing you this way, there's, you know, there's a full spectrum of consultants. Some know what they're doing. Some have no clue. Some are, are looking at this as an opportunity because there's so many people in need. Yeah. Um, yeah. So be careful, like do your homework, ask the questions. Good. I wouldn't do the sampling. I've been doing this for 30 years and I have never sampled for this just to okay. give it context. Yeah. The my clients I have come to me in regards to this are ones that are being pushed back and are right next to burnt homes. Part of their house was on fire. Um, not getting any kind of assistance, trying to basically prove insurance adjusters are telling them, get a lab result, get some documentation to prove, uh, prove this, and then we will approve you for what you need. So um, I guess when you see this sample result, does that prove that they've got a problem here? Because I'm no. so no, for sir. me, the way I look at it is I, and I know that dioxins, they're present in our food. Um, they are also admitted into streams, water sources, things like that. It is present, it is natural. Um, however, you're talking about ingestible compared to inhalable. And for me, when I look at this, I go on the assumption route because I have had you know, a lot of non-detect all across the board for this, for homes that have been farther away from the fire areas, the burn zones where they haven't had anything present. So when I see that on homes that are farther away and you get closer in proximity and you see this start to come up, especially, you know, when you look at the toxic equivalent quantity, you, you begin to say, okay, the yeah. assumption is, and based off of visual as well, that this is most likely produced in the home from a combustion source. There is no data to prove that otherwise, but when you pull all that stuff in together, that would be the assumption. So, but this is not something <clears throat> uniformly people would be testing for. It's well, let's, what you're let's, it's building a case. And I don't recommend it for everyone. There's some but, people I'm like, you, you, don't, you don't need this. There is no need for you to even have this or, um, you know, go and do your cleaning first and then, well, you know, peace of mind. There's a lot of people that, well, peace of mind, I want to know. And I tell them, okay, well, most likely this is going to come back with nothing to show you on this. Like there, it's going to come back good and you're going to be able to keep your stuff just because I, my experience and knowing when I look at certain things or what kind of materials, things like that, proximity, visual inspection, I tell people, I'm like, you don't need to do this. And there's just many out there that want to do it because it brings them a peace of mind. And I think a lot of it also came from, you know, a webinar that was done where it was produced, like, this is important. You have to do this. And a lot of that comes into play for people who the fire was inside your home. It is completely different if you have a fire inside your home. It can change a lot of the toxic levels from a fire being produced outside your home. Some of them can be the same, but that can change it as well. So I, 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 think, I think hopefully we close with this maybe isn't the best test to show, but I think Janine, gave you good advice based on a, her experience that you got to do the, the tape test for the, for the mm -hmm. ash, char, and soot. Uh, and there, the good news is that's not as expensive as this kind of a lab analysis. Yes. And the second okay. thing is she recommended uh, particle sample uh, testing or particle air sampling. And this, that's new to me, but when I read her report, I understood very much so why that oh. worked and that's and she's right you the consultant can rent an instrument and get uh, and also get tape and do the tape samples so but along with their thorough observation documentation and at least those two tests um, uh, you're, you're well on your way and 
you can get as as it evolves. You know, you you can talk to your consultant about, well, do we want to do this or that, and they'll advise you. Uh, I when, don't I don't I don't like to get talked into doing testing that people want to do because they think they need it. Uh, all of us have done testing that we didn't think because the client wants it, but then we're stuck with the, with evaluating it and telling it what it means, and we're stuck. We didn't want to do it in the first place. We got it, you know, we got this result. So what do you do with it? If I don't know how to do it, I will say, or if I'm not familiar with it, I'm not someone that's going to come in and take over that and do that for you. No, no. Um, but I mean, people could go away from a seminar and say, I got to have this testing. And Dawn was and very helps. careful about the two tests she, she mentioned right up front. Those are cost effective, very good yep. ways of getting information quickly. I would and, also, and relatively inexpensive. Okay, I, I would also want to just um, educate people on um, you don't have to just do tape lift. You can do a swab. Um, there are labs that say tape lift only, um, but you're only getting, you can't make a decision on your house on 10 square inches of scotch tape. So, um, you know, I, I do presence or absence. Um, the swab, it's an alcohol swab you get from Costco. You change yeah. your gloves in between every sample and you get in the window trough and you get behind the light um, plate or wherever. So um, if people are just doing, I do a combination of tape lift and, and swab. Um, I'm, but I, I, if I'm just gonna do one, it's a swab because I can't get my tape lift into a window trough. So- I like the wipes too. Yeah, so it just um, there's no right way to you know it, it more there's more than one way to do that. So if people are using tape lift, it's okay, but they're just know they're not going to be able to get in the window troughs. If they're doing a combination, that's probably the best. Um, but anyway, just want to give you that education. If people are like, you have to do tape lift. No, you don't, and the cost is the same, tape lift or swab. You're looking for pre presence or absence, in my opinion, at at that initial point. And it's like a, a pregnancy test. Are you are you in or out? And um, so if you're not getting a lot of, of soot charn ash, that doesn't mean the party's over. That just means, okay, now I'm gonna look at the airborne particulate. If that, I look for layers of confirmation when I'm doing my surveys. It's kind of an orthogonal approach. So I look for many independent tests to point to the same answer. So everybody has a different approach in doing it, but that's my approach. So um, just, you know, we just really want to give you education so you're picking the right person and you're asking the right questions so you're confident in the in the work that they're doing for you right and and so this is an example from uh, uh, VOC's testing and I, I know when we looked at this example um, there were things that were of might have been a concern but the items that were listed here I believe you uh, Dawn you had mentioned that these were not things standard. that you would be concerned about yeah right. these are pretty standard but what are you looking for well i just want to point out that ethyl alcohol is like the alcohol that you drink like when you drink vodka <laughs> or, or beer that's ethyl alcohol so um i don't even know why that's on here and it's um, in cleaning chemicals too it's using cleaning chemicals mm -hmm. okay well anyway part per billion this is an ingestible so it's you know this is, I don't even know why we're sampling for it. Um, right. The acetone, we have acetone in our homes. If you have ice, you know, or, you know, it's paint thinner, whatever, that's got a very high exposure limit. I'm not worried about that. And isopropyl alcohol is also something we probably all have in our mm -hmm. home. So th this test right here would be a waste of money, in my opinion, um, post fire. So again, know what you're, consultant's going to sample for before they do it. You should say, well, what VOCs are you looking for? And if they say, well, we're going to do volatile organic compounds, that sounds really fancy, but all they're sampling here is hydrocarbons that are common household hydrocarbons. So, so this badge picks up a lot more than just what you're seeing. I mean, it's hundreds, hundreds of them. It does benzene. Um, it does different types of butanes. It does uh, methanes. It like there is a whole. It, it does a lot of different uh, furans. Like it picks up all kinds of chemicals. It's not limited to these. So this is ones that were only found inside of the home. 
But these are uh, things that people should not be worried about what's on. Exactly. Here. These yeah. are standard in every home. If I was to test my home, this is going to come back on it. Okay. Um, and so again, knowing what they're testing for and why, right? Yeah. And, then and that, making that sure they can explain the, that to right. you and say, hey, this is not of a concern. So right. when, one other key thing, there is a direct read instrument called a photoionization detector that will look for VOCs. It doesn't pick up formaldehyde either. Um, it doesn't tell you what it is, but it'll tell you if something's there or not. And then that may dictate uh, whether you need more sampling or not. That instrument costs about $175 to rent. Um, and the consultant could rent it if they don't own one. Um, but it, it'll tell you Again, there's something here or there's something not here in the part per billion range. It's non-specific, but it will pick up all those chemicals that were on that badge. And it could be end up being a lot cheaper analytically, fee-wise speaking. Um, and then if you get a hit and you have health effects, then you can hone in on, on what to do the analytical testing for. So just another tip for you guys. And then you mentioned a couple of, um, sorry, Val, you mentioned a couple of, um, of testing devices and you even talked about how much they cost. And I'm thinking there's probably people watching this um, that are thinking, well, hey, you know, maybe we should invest in buying one of these units. I mean, are there are there testing devices that a lay person could use or is this all for the experts? This is really just a matter of um, what what your what your um, experts should have or know about. There are testing things that the homeowner can buy. Um, there's some Amazon. Um, I could look up the names of them. I don't know them off the top of my head, but it, it'll do particulate and it'll do VOCs and it will have a light on it, like air quality, not good or something. A red light will come on. Um, so another, another thing that I recommend to some of my clients that have reoccupied their homes is to get a, um, one of those HEPA air filters, you know, that kind of circulate. Um, you can't put HEPA filters on your HVAC because you'll collapse the ductwork, um, but you can have them on floor models. So if you have people that are, you know, if you, some people don't have a choice, they have to go back home, period. Right. They don't have ALE money and they have to go back home. So I would um, recommend that they invest in one of those to help scrub the air, if you will. And with yeah, carbon, fil carbon filtration is really good for that kind of stuff as well, um, uh, along with uh, the HEPA. Yeah, the big limitation with carbon filtration is you got to know when uh, the organics are going to break through and, and so, change uh, it. So you, yeah. you have to have a routine changing schedule uh, and or you could probably use that same PID uh, to see if, you know, stuff's going through it. Well, and just to educate the homeowners about carbon filters. So if you think of a sponge, you know, you have a sponge in your kitchen sink. And your sponge can hold so much water, right? And it can yeah. hang on to that water. And then when the sponge gets too full, water starts leaking out. That's kind of mm -hmm. how a carbon filter works. So once the carbon filter gets full, it can't hang on to it anymore and it's gonna pop off organic vapor. So it's called adsorption um, and then it can be desorbed back out. So um, just, to, just to give you a visual of how that stuff works. That's what he was talking about, a change out schedule before yes. Sort of the sponge overflows and you start having stuff leak back out and the yeah. good ones the good purifiers should be letting you know when that needs to happen yeah. um you, you know like air doctor i have air doctors in my house and my air doctor as soon as my carbon is done it it alerts me so they should they should be telling you about carbon charcoal is good too um hepa hepa is really good they're and they're they they don't filter the whole house air what people are doing is putting them in rooms or moving them around um, but they have a very local effect yeah they just do. so you got to keep remembering that and and a lot of the air gets recycled around them but but there's 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 a lot of good evidence that they work uh, we had a, uh, a I don't know if most of the people that are listening know a researcher at CU that put instruments in homes right after the fire. But these these home, even a homemade device, uh, you know, uh, was working rather well for uh, organics and the particulates, so. Let's, let's um, hop over to heavy metals. Again, a test that a lot of people are getting 
Um, this is the example that Michael had mentioned earlier where you'll have a blank um, and then you'll have um, you know, the, the actual testing that happens so that they, they basically made sure that their, um, their, their testing situation is, is correct. Um, but a lot of people are getting this testing done for, for heavy metals. Um, but again, what are, what are we actually looking for here? Because um, I have an example so, here of um, this was a, a certificate of analysis, a report on heavy metals. And um, I've circled here in red that uh, while it says copper and nickel are bolded, it's per sample. That sample is undefined. There's nothing that says what this actually means. I'd like to jump on this one um, because there has been homes that have come back with high levels of lead and arsenic on the walls and surfaces inside of homes. These levels that are on here, there is no concern with them. They're pretty standard. We have heavy metals in our home. We have heavy metals in our body all the time. They're in the soil, things like that. When I do any kind of heavy metal testing, what am I looking for? I'm honestly looking for the presence of lead. Lead has been shown that it can be cleaned from the walls, but we are finding it pre-remediation inside of homes produced by things that have burned in the area from other homes that vapor just kind of made its way in and attached and that lead is there. I have done books, I have done toys. And the reason I look for this mainly post remediation is because for one, for children who are younger, again, back to habits, when I think of this, I think of, would I allow my child to have a book that has lead present on it? No, I would not or have back some toys that has the presence of lead on it. No, I would not. So for me, that is my reasoning behind it is I wanna make sure that the things that are going back into my family's hands or windowsills and homes, um, floors, wood floors, they're gonna be crawling around on, do not have the presence of that because really there is no safe level of lead. And that is my, my main concern behind it. I know a lot of people do compare it to soil contamination and say, well, soil contamination, this is okay. It is, but this is not outside of our home in the soil. This is in our home produced in a different way. And if I was to test inside of my home, I typically should not find lead in my home unless I have a product that is lead containing. But this gets back into what, you know, what, what does this mean? And so Dom, for this one, uh, this, this last example here of heavy metals, lead is bolded, it's 34 milligrams per kilogram. Um, but that when, when you do the math on that, it's, it's actually still, um, I believe when we talked about this earlier, it, the math on this is not, it would not flag for this being a concern. Well, it's parts per million. So um, I don't do this in my practice. I'm not saying it's it's a bad thing to do. I think it's you know it's a comprehensive thing to do. Um, if you want to swab for for heavy metals post remediation, it, it makes sense to me. But I haven't done it in my practice. Um, it's uh, you know post remediation and and what I witness is doesn't happen that often that I see. Um, but I think some people are getting it, which I think is wonderful. Um, to measure the efficacy of whatever remediation was done. Um, but I wouldn't raise an eyebrow at, at these results. And I think- No, I, I wouldn't either. And I, I think if for, for inside, Janine, inside of a house, um, you would wanna do a wipe sample for lead if you're gonna look for how it affects uh, children um, and, and adults. I mean, you would do wipe samples on, on things like window sills, uh, but that's outside of a fire. I think, I think this is lead testing in general would be a refinement. And I think you hit it on the head that you would, you would wanna verify the house is clean enough. Well, you could, you know, as a bonus, you know, you could do a few wipes, a number of wipes and, and look for, you know, some, some uh, levels of lead in the, in the house. Uh, for, for future, you know, other cleanup. Uh, but I, I don't think I would be doing 
metals um, to get an idea of how, how much smoke residual risk you have in your house. Yeah, um, I, I mean, I, and I definitely agree with that. Like I said, it just comes down to more so a peace of mind and knowing a lot of these people have young children that crawl around on the floor and um, want to keep yeah. toys and books and making sure that those things that they are going to be in contact with on a regular basis, you know, we want to make sure the walls and the windowsills and things like that. Yeah, are I, yeah, I, 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 I do let let a set or did let assessments, so I, I know how that works. Uh, but that those results were in a concentration in dust, and it wasn't going to help you very much. I right. don't think. I, I, I don't even know what. Again, I don't know where it was collected, what the reason was, what the strategy was, and what you're supposed to glean from that. But if and you then, wanted to look for lead, you would uh, in a house after cleanup, you would do wipe testing. Yes, and, and that again goes back to the idea of when you're hiring professional help, they're doing testing based on their observation, what they're what they're seeing with your situation, and yeah. and providing you that peace of mind. I mean, so, Blanket, I mean, heavy now, metal testing is not so, something you expect to see. And this goes toward here. Here's an example. If you it goes toward the good uh, observations report, so you know you go out there as a consultant that you know you're going to look around the neighborhood before you even go in the house. You're going to look at all sides of the house and stand back and take a look, you know, at soffits and roofs and you know, and then you might look across the street and if you just you know, if, if these guys were happened to be near a lead breaking facility where they recycle lead acid batteries and that place burned down along with everything else, lead could be an issue. You see what I mean? So you start from, you start from general and you go to specific. Right, right. Let's, so uh, Dawn, I've got your uh, particulate concentration, those two slides you wanted to share. Yeah, I just wanted to show people. So I was doing a job in Santa Rosa. I, I like I said, I travel all over, but I um, was sampling a house in Napa and we had rented a, a house in Santa Rosa because anyway, it was a long sampling project. And so I questioned my meters all the time because that's, you know, I want to make sure my meters are working and that I'm you know, speaking the truth, so to speak. And so I have a questioning attitude even about my own work, which I think is, is healthy in a way just to make sure that I'm, you know, current and, and uh, present and paying attention and all that stuff. So we, uh, we're sampling this client's house and the particulate counts were off the charts, like literally off the charts. So then you're like, is my meter broken? Is this really working so I sampled the VRBO <laughs> where we were staying and I wanted to point out like it was like a light drizzle outside so you would think you know that the particulate count would be impacted by that it may be a little lower than normal outside which maybe it is but it didn't seem to impact the comparison from the outside to the inside so if you um the green is is average outside that's your point of comparison and if you have somebody doing particulate counts in your house and you have a large home um, it's likely that it's going to take a couple hours for that to happen and to sample every how every room in your house every closet the attic space they should be crawling out they, they your people should become very intimate with your house um so it's it's it would be normal for them to go back and sample outside again um, several times if it's going to be because the particulate changes outside like the wind blows. In this case, I was able to do the whole little house in the span of 20 minutes. So I didn't take I just did two outside initially. But if you look at the, you know, so we're looking at point. Oh, oh sorry, wrong one. Wrong one. Um, the 0 0.3 micron is the smallest cut size and you look outside and it's 46,000, but all my counts inside, they look like pretty scary numbers, but they're all less than outside. And that's our goal. It doesn't have to be zero. It just has to be less than outside. That's clean air. Um, 0.5, I'm half of what it is outside, essentially. That's good you know, the one micron, super small, all of these, anything less than five microns can make it down into your lower lung. So these are really important numbers. But again, um, I'm, I'm a fraction of what it is outside. When I do a post-fire environment, you can go to the next slide. This is a post-fire environment in Paradise um, 
from the campfire and um, the outside is is 44,000. So we're not seeing a big change um, here, but I want to pay attention to the samples like at 1010 where I don't know if you can see this slide. Okay, but all of a sudden it jumps from 65,000 to 106,000. That's a big jump. And then look across the board, all those samples taken in that northeast bedroom corner have jumped really high. And you're thinking, why is that? Here's where your visual observation comes into play. This house was not burned. The, the um, fence behind the house caught on fire as part of the Paradise Fire and the neighbor put out the fire on the fence. But there was a drain line or something that was embedded in the stucco and that drain line came out and it, the drain line was melted. That's my visual observation. So there was enough heat from the fence being on fire, you know, and the whole town of Paradise is decimated, but their their neighborhood wasn't leveled like other neighborhoods. I think the house, it was kind of spotty, like the house two doors down burned to the ground and then skipped a whole bunch of houses. So it wasn't like the whole block went. Um, but there was a, that drain line was melted and I was really interested in that. And then here I get my sample results and it's confirming what I'm seeing visually. So, um, there's some that was never remediated properly. Nobody even inspected that burned little drain line. And she didn't have scorch marks on the outside of her house. It was just from the radiant heat from the proximity of the fire. So you have to look at thermal damage. You have to look at chemical damage and, and um, you know, the fire debris getting into your house. So it's, it's kind of three insults that your consultant should be looking for. But if I didn't have that visual observation, you know, how do I explain this burp in my results here? So, but you look at the whole house. I mean, this is just an excerpt. We did um, probably 150, 180 samples. Um, their powers of 10 higher. So look at five microns, it's 133 outside and I've got 12,000 in the house. That's a problem. That's a big problem. So I love my particulate meter. I think every PA should have one in their back of their car. Um, not only for the homeowner, but for their own health and safety too, because these these guys and ladies that are going out doing these initial inspections should be wearing PPE for sure. So, um, all right, and I think we've mostly addressed this, but just um, you know, uh, the question, the ending question here: Why are they allowed to ignore science? And I think you've already hit on that. Really, that there's no consensus on what the science says. Um, and it's an and, old model. It's an old model they're following. Yeah. But also getting back into, well, you know, what are you testing for and what do those measures actually mean? All right, let's go on hidden health dangers. Um, I, I, we've, we've, we've talked about a lot of this up front. So I just, if there's anything we haven't hit on, please feel free, feel free to throw it in. Otherwise, I'll keep us moving. I, I feel like we've pretty much addressed this one. All right, going to keep us going. Commonly overlooked areas to test. Um, and, and you guys have already alluded to this. Uh, the walls, cavities, those subfloor, ceiling nooks, crawl spaces, you know, the ductwork, the insulation. Um, these, these are areas that, that should be on the radar um, to, um, you know, to, to be part of that inspection if, depending on what, the, uh, what, the, uh, what, the, what your observation has pulled out. Um, and now how houses breathe, because you guys have all talked about this, you know, you, you end up taking these particulates, the smoke, all of the stuff, and it just, it, 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 char as Dawn, as you said, it charges the home. Um, and, and so uh, I'd like for you guys just to explain how smoke outside is suddenly in my walls and, you know, and I can see ash and, and soot and, and basically fire, smoke, debris, inside my electrical outlets and things like that. What, how does this happen? So the wall cavities are breathing too. Um, there's a lot of air movement going on in wall cavities that people don't really realize, but there's all pressure differentials. If you open a window or open your front door, you're changing pressure all over the house. So, um, and that's, that's normal. That happens all the time. 
So that's how particles can move. That's how gases can move through your house. All right, let's keep moving. Deep breath. Breathing with the house, yes. <laughs> All right, these are just some examples of things we've talked about. Unless there's something you, you want to share, I just wanted to have these visuals to walk people through so you can see. We've got well, that. yeah, this is, a good, this is a good example of, you know, the picture can help tell the story, but you also have to put this in perspective. What window was it? Where was it? Is the, is the seal around the window in good shape? Is it melted? Uh, are there gaps, holes? Um, if you have pets, because it's hard to tell, is that dog hair? Or is yeah, that yeah, I, I, you, you almost have I, to. In my house, it would be dog hair, yes. <laughs> <laughs> when I watch my kids' dogs, it is, yeah. Yeah, so, but I mean, the, the, and, and the idea, you know, ideally in a report, um, that you're going to have these types of photos, but they, they do tell that story. Um, Here's an example of refrigerator coil covered in particulates. And Dawn, you had mentioned this, you know, the Department of Energy has uh, information about how this can erode the, the electronic uh, connections, those, those boards and poles, and, and cause items to fail prematurely. So I, I, did, I did want to flag this issue. Well, and, and that, you know, the failure can happen years later. So if you really want to, you know, if you're trying to measure the total loss, um, you may want to have your, your surfaces swabbed for, for anions too, for chloride and sulfate anions, right. because um, those are corrosive, they're oxidizers. So what happens a lot is the, the coating on your electronics board and your computer, or whatever electronics you have in your house, that gets etched from the acid gas that's floating with the smoke that's gone through your house. And so those boards short out, um, their lifespan is impacted. And so the DOE has um, some limit, some guidelines of you know, what, what is high on chloride anions and stuff. And so um, that's a test I, I do on request of clients, but it, it has really nothing so much to do with health effects more so than it does how far does the damage go in your house kind of thing. So if you're, if you have a lot of, you know, some people have audio visual rooms, some people have movie rooms, mm -hmm. you know, you may not even think about that, that, you know, it's a metal case, I can wipe it off, but really it, it may be, you know, have lost its useful life because of the etching that's gone in on the inside. Okay. Yeah. And, and that, that acid gas that Dawn's talking about, the uh, tell me if I'm wrong, nylon carpet is a good source of that. Well, 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 rugs produce a hydrogen cyanide gas. So it, when I go sample with my gas med, I can pick up, you know, up to 50 different chemicals at one time on one right. pass. So, right. um, and I can, you know, but that, again, it's just, I don't, I'm not saying everybody should have their house tested with gas met. It, it really gets back to your initial evaluation, your walkthrough, are there health effects? Right. Like Janine said, the proximity to the fire, that's huge. That's going to dictate the sampling plan, but every person who's coming out to do a test in your house should have a sampling plan and there should be a reason behind everything that they're doing. That's the main yeah. thing. And then, um, you know, again, going back into your, your building the story, you're telling the story. And, and so for this example, the upper windows were all original. You can see there's a lot of leakage here. Um, and again, that's going to feed into particulates and all of that information. Uh, and then uh, the attic know, insulation. So if I could just, on the window thing, we know that um, manufacturer's warranties will be voided if the window has been exposed to a certain a degree of heat. So that's just another argument to use with an adjuster um, if you have you know, evidence like this. Yeah, thank you for that, Amy. Um, and then insulation is, is an example uh, in the less accessible area that is visibly covered in soot, char, and ash. Um, and, and so, you know, making sure all of that is removed. Uh, and, and, they don't, and they cheat, oh, just one, one quick point on that. 
when you have your insulation removed, I would go up and physically inspect before they put the new insulation in because they're cheating you. They're, they're not getting to the hard to reach piece, places because they're hard to reach and they don't want to go. But so they just, they'll put it over the old stuff. I've seen it all and my particulate counter is what's picking it up. So um, make sure that they have physically, have them take pictures. You know, if you don't want to go up there, you're not able to go up in the attic, but make sure they have taken out everything, even the hard to reach corners that, you know, you have to monkey to get in there because otherwise it's, it's, it's not going to be effective in, rem in the remediation. I just had someone post remediation who it was sitting on one of the trusses in the attic, old stuff was still sitting up there. And when you dug down to the bottom, like you, you got to move that stuff around. That's, that's part of the removal, HEPA vacuuming, uh, the whole process of it and making sure the insulation company actually knows what they're doing in this situation. And they're just not a company that comes in and does insulation in new houses. This is completely different than install installation. Got it. Thank you for that. Um, all right, report uh, prep best practices. So what, why do findings matter? You, you guys have talked about this. You're, you know, you're documenting, you're telling that story for your insurance company, showing the damage you have and the steps that need to be taken to, uh, do, uh, to move that uh, remediation forward. Um, testing matter, methods obviously matter. Uh, you know, the, Obviously, there's still there. So, char ash sampling, that tape sampling we talked about earlier, uh, micro vacuum air sampling for soft goods, uh, testing for aldehydes, uh, you know, chain of, you know, making sure that they have solid uh, chain of custody procedures. Um, and uh, let's go. Here's an example of that tape lift sample analysis. Again, these are just examples to show you guys what these things look like. Uh, sample reports, just calling out, there's a wide variation in reporting styles, uh, you know, but you're looking for uh, the, the professional you've hired to take the observ right observations, uh, taking those, the lab testing and building that into recommendations of, of what needs to be done, uh, you know, depending on the extent of the damage concerns about health concerns. Uh, you want to make sure that the, um, they, they got that chain of custody documented for all samples, lab testing done by an independent lab, not associated with the tester. Um, and, and again, as Dawn said, you know, they need to be experienced in what they're doing at, or she will fire them. Uh, your lab should not be interpreting your results. Like Michael said, they're, in, they are, they're not going to take that and say, you need to take these steps. They're there to interpret the, the information that they receive from testing. So I'm sorry to um, interrupt Val, but is on that third, if you could just go back for a split second, um, on the laboratory testing should be done by independent lab not associated with the tester. I'm going to wildly guess that in a lot of cases when an insurance company has brought in an IH, um, they may actually have a relationship with the, with the lab. So is this a hard and fast rule expert panel, not that uh, bullet point, point number four? I don't see that a lot. I see that the industrial hygienist is separate from the lab. I mean, that's pretty standard practice in the world of industrial hygiene. So I get a lot of reports from clients um, just asking to look over other IHs who insurance um, sent that person out. And it's not always the same labs used. But sometimes um, it is. I mean, there's only a few select labs that you're gonna to wanna to use, but there is no consistency between all of them okay. uh, that they all use the same exact lab. Some of them will use reservoirs, some will use EAA. Um, so it really just kind of depends, but there is no consistency in it. Like they don't all use the same. Okay, um, so I have heard, you know, at, at conferences with lawyers and, you know, talking about this, that there are certain labs that are kind of known to be um, <clears throat> frequently used by insurance companies, and I'm, I'm hearing it's not black and white, but just this might be a good time for me to ask this question um, of the panel, and 
you know, can you ever trust an industrial hygienist that your insurance company has brought in? I'll, I'll take that one. I, I think you can, but I think you have to ask the right question. So um, if they're, you know, looking to see their redacted report, all the things that we've talked about are going to vet that thing out. If, if they're using the, um, the lab that uses the wildfire indicators, um, then I would start, my, my red flags would start going up. Um, as an industrial hygienist, um, you know, I know, and this is going to probably come out the wrong way, but I know where to take samples to get a negative result. Um, and, and that's not the goal here. The goal is, you know, and that's why I do this orthogonal approach because it's not just one thing, it's multiple things that are wrong. And, and so if they're sampling in an area where there's no visible um, debris and no soot, char, and ash that you can even see with your naked eye, and that's where they're collecting their sample, they're looking for that negative result, um, it becomes pretty obvious pretty fast. So I'm not saying you can't trust them, but, um, you know, there's a lot of work in the insurance arena for people like me. And, um, and so they, you know, it, it's sad, but their bias does become inserted in some cases where they want to keep, keep their client because it's a big cash cow and keep the workflow. So um, it doesn't mean that all ethics are out the window, but um, I think if you ask pointed questions and are educated on, on uh, you know, what, where they're taking samples, is it truly representative of your home or did they just take three samples and say you're fine? So um, it's just understanding. Um, I think I think this this group has been really good because it's, you're getting a wealth of information in a really short amount of time, but um, ask for the redacted report, see what their recommendations are. You know, if their recommendation is to get a Swiffer, then, then I wouldn't trust them. If their recommendation is, you know, to do some, remove the insulation, get your soft goods out, which some insurance companies are recommending, then I think they're more on, more on the right page. So um, you just have to, you know, kind of unfortunately do your homework and vet these people out. But there are ones you can trust, but there's also people like me that are independent that, um, you know, you, you have to do the same. You can't trust everybody because they're not associated with the insurance company. I would worry about um, people flocking to that area to do work, um, people who are not qualified to do the work and they just look at it as a big cash cow. It's not that they're, um, you know, they're trying to make money. That's their goal. They don't, you know, yep. not really that they're not trustworthy, but they're really in an arena where they don't belong kind of thing. So. You have that everywhere too. So you just have to be, keep yourself educated, keep asking questions. If you have a consultant and they get uncomfortable because you're asking all the questions and that's a red flag that they're probably not the right person for you too, so. Yeah. And I think a lot of people also are running into where the, uh, the certified IH or whoever the insurance company is being sent out, they will ask those questions and be told we can't discuss that with you because you're not the one that hired us. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> they're being told that if they do not use this person or allow them to come in and do this testing for them, they're gonna be cut off from ALE. They're gonna be cut off from everything and they're being threatened, which they cannot do, but they're trying to put the fear into them like, hey, if you don't follow what we say happens, we control this, not you, then you're just gonna suffer you know, you have the right to ask for an new gesture, go to the DOI, submit a complaint against them, um, you know, take additional steps and don't stop there and just throw your hands up to them because of that while you're doing that due diligence as well. Right, 100% complain to the Department of Insurance um, and, you know, that it's not acceptable for an insurance company, for somebody who has been retained to, to inspect your house to um, not be willing to share information with you and to say that that um, we're working for the insurer, not you. Because just like Dawn said, I've actually witnessed reports and inspections where the person that was sent out by insurance, the homeowner said, this area has already been touched by the cleaning company that we put a stop to. 
we're trying to determine upstairs. And they were like, no, we're gonna test down here. Or these new vents were placed in this house after the fire, we're gonna test here. They're looking for negative results, like she said. Right. Well, and, and just to wrap on the, um, uh, the best practices in the report, we keep going back to that. Uh, this is the general outline that our experts had agreed to. What, uh, what, what you're looking for in there. And as Michael said, the good consultants don't shy away from health recommendations or conclusions. They want to stand by what they saw based on their professional expertise. But you know, just you know, focusing on what is the background, what are they trying to accomplish, what the scope is, the methodology, how, how did they do their observations, what yeah, testing. It, the, the report's your report. If you don't understand it, and really don't understand it, then you need to give that feedback and have it rewritten to some degree. Because it should be pretty clear. Two things should be clear if you have a good experience consultant. Um, what they did, and you know their conclusions and recommendations very clearly. There's no if, you know, you're, you're clear. There is a problem here because of all the data and the methodology and the discussion and the records and the notes and the testing, you know, they have a conclusion that makes sense. They, they all follow. Be, they all should that be interpreting, follows. Yeah, they should be interpreting the lab results too, not just. Yes, yeah, no, not just giving you lab results. Lab results and their chains of custody, you should get them from the consultant, in my opinion. I don't know anybody that doesn't, but. Mm -hmm. I mean, they should freely give you that as an appendix, give you anything, field notes, everything. And, uh, um, but you, sh you should be able to read it in a normal way and, and be very clear about what they did and what they concluded and recommended. And you know why they recommended that because of certain observations or tests that they refer to. Right, right. I'm going to just breeze through these slides. We've talked a lot about this, um, you know, the chain of custody methods. Here's an example of what that would look like. Uh, here's a chain of custody form from EMSL. Um, so these are things you might see documented. Uh, we've already talked about this, uh, what the standards, you know, where are they? Um, the, these, this set of standards are pending, but we have no consensus standards published. Um, and this doesn't mean, as our expert said, that there are no standards, there's just no reference numbers at this time. Um, so when we've most addressed most of the points on this, going to keep us going. Red flags when you're looking at that report. Um, if there's no recommendations on your attic and your HVAC, uh, these are very commonly affected. So you would expect to find in that report a comment on each of these. And as Michael said, if you don't if, if you, these things are missing or you, it's not clear what was done, go back and ask because that should be very clear to you what's going on. Um, and then interpreting these results into practical action for your home. So when to move back. You know, so if you've got health sensitivities, um, uh, you know, and, and you find that debris is not being properly wetted during excavation, i.e. across the street from you, uh, next door, um, you know, you might want to see if you if you can wait on remediation uh, until the excavation is complete, or be prepared to do that light cleaning afterwards and take certain steps to keep um, uh, your remediation as intact as possible until that evacuation is confirmed. And the reasons, you know, trying not to move back in until it's complete, because as Amy mentioned much earlier, those ALE approvals are difficult once you're back home to go back out. Uh, as Dawn mentioned, you know, these unseen residues can harm your health. Uh, it is uh, practically impossible to live in the middle of your remediation. If they're going to vacuum your house top to bottom, do all this cleaning, there's no way you really can be in there. Um, and just, you know, calling out that caveat, no one knows your home or your health like you do. Uh, what makes a home uninhabitable? Um, these are things that, uh, you know, we, we've shared before. I'm not going to read through them all. I do want to point out there are two publications here uh, that you can uh, download for yourself. Uh, one by UCSD about uh, uh, fine particulate matter and wildfire smoke. Uh, the other one is a Patrick Moffat publication, uh, the one on the uphelp.org site, that updated bulletin 202. Uh, both of those have some very good information for you. Mitigation process. Uh, this is just a 
high um, uh, a high level uh, outline of what this would look like. We will have a webinar coming up on this uh, on the 18th, as Amy mentioned earlier, that we'll talk about more about remediation and what that looks like. But this is just that overview of what this looks like for you. Um, and then going back to, um, you know, once you're in, um, as, as the area around you is still being cleaned up, debris is being removed, those post-mitigation follow-up process, what that looks like. Big takeaways here, limiting tracking outdoor resi residual contaminants into the house, uh, removing your shoes at the door, uh, wearing disposable shoe covers when entering if, if you're going to wear your shoes, uh, keeping your walkway and porch clean and clear as possible, HEPA vacuum on all floors daily, uh, cleaning your surfaces and your entryways. Um, Michael and um, Dawn and Janine all talked about this, changing your furnaces uh, weekly, depending on what kind of furnace uh, filter you have for your furnace. Um, and then using those carbon help with HEPA or help a filter uh, air purifiers in your house. Uh, I've got three more questions here to um, just pop in. Post cleaning testing, uh, what testing should we have done post mitigation to ensure these things are um, safe in our house? I know we've, we've touched on that. Is there anything you've, uh, our experts think we've missed? No, I think, I think we covered a lot. I mean, a really broad brush and, um, you know, I, if, uh, if there's anything that I can help you with or questions I can answer, I'd be happy to do so if you think of something tomorrow or whatever. Um, and you can reach, you know, maybe through the up help people to get back to me, but I'm happy to offer um, some, some guidance, you know, limited, I should say. <laughs> you know, a question or two. Now we will appreciate it. And we are going to be doing a Q and A, um, so there will be an opportunity on the twenty fifth for um, to you know get people more information. All right, let's go over question seven. Um, our adjuster denied post remediation testing. What's the best way to change to not mine? I know Dawn, you said that it's that from your experience, it's not common for insurers to to provide that pay for that. It's, I haven't seen it. Yeah, I, I, I see, what I see is that it's not happening, period. So I think Janine has seen mm -hmm. that it is happening, which I think is wonderful, but I, I haven't seen it. Um, We're also hearing from a public adjuster volunteers that, that that's something that they always get, get paid for, um, at least, you know, so, so clearly it's a, it's it's another one of these things where um, for some people it's a big fight for others um, it's a standard procedure before moving back in. I have been seeing more post remediation than pre approvals. Um, I have clients who come to me and I can provide them with estimates. I can speak with their adjuster. Um, you know concentration levels for such R and ash I think is one of my recommendations. Air sampling. Um, for the particulate count, you know, so char, ash, other particulates in the air, what that looks like are gonna be the two biggest ones. Um, typically I recommend, you know, VOC as well. We can also do a walkthrough monitor that I have with VOC formaldehyde and particulate matter, a real-time monitor. Not as fancy as Dawn's, but I am gonna get more information on her in the regards to that okay. to learn more. Okay. But, um, you know, reach out and say, hey, can you chat with my adjuster? Let them know why this is of concern, why I want to do this, why it's important, and see if you can't get help to push that along has been it, successful for me. It, yeah, it, it really depends what tests you do on who's doing what. You know, if you were, because if you break it down, you want to evaluate maybe the Maybe the, the walls in the house were in pretty good shape, so they were cleaned. You know, you would test the wall. And, and the time frames need to be close to when whatever the cleaner was that did it, you know, close to when they finished, because they need that feedback loop. And, or an attic, you know, there, there can be, you would do different testing up there. I think Dawn already touched that. So it really depends, Janine. I don't, I don't, think and and, and 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 some homes are quite a distance 
from the from the site. And this, you know, it's still important to do some kind of evaluation of what the cleaner did. And one thing that's done is to uh, is to uh, test. Another thing that's done, you know, some people watch. You know, they might pay somebody. So I know this is a complicated process for cleaning a wall, for example. Uh, and it's not as simple, you know, job of just wiping it down with a sponge and water. Um, so, you know, somebody taking notes, somebody that was present while they were doing it is very good. Yeah, and like I said, we'll, we'll, we'll be doing a deeper dive on remediation on the 18th. Yeah. Um, this was a, a last, I think it's the last question we've got. Um, so what do you do when the, um, the restoration company doesn't have a, an opinion or a service to restore a product? So the example was a built-in cast iron gas barbecue on the back deck. Uh, where would people find that if there's not a, 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 an answer available? How, how, do you, how do you solve you know, that? You know, I, I've talked to a number of people who've had these, and the advice always is to get rid of it. If it's been near the fire and all those gaskets, it's a natural gas grill, are, are damaged, that's a dangerous piece of equipment. You, you need to replace the burners. Anyway, so it, it's different for, that's uh, cast iron gas. So that, that's got to be uh, rebuilt. You can't use the same uh, valves, the operating valves uh, that were out there and subjected to that heat. And you either repair it or replace it. Got it. All right, thank it's you. It's a safety issue. And then uh, remediation estimates, uh, you know, again, we're, we're going to talk about this later, but uh, just throwing out that, that guidance, uh, you know, when you get your report, it should identify all the areas for remediation. That's what you're going to take. Uh, all the protocols should be clearly identified. Um, and as, as we mentioned earlier, if that IH can attend the insurance investors inspection, um, our experts have seen that's a positive if you can make that happen. Um, you know, and then we've talked about the third party testing to ensure the remediation was a success if you can get it. Obviously, it's not the remediation company doing the work tests and you want to have uh, independent verification. That that was the, I, I want to make a point. A lot of people asked for some consultant to verify the cleaning was done and correctly. And if they don't have a background on what was there beforehand, they're not going to do as good a job. Uh, it's so I just bring that up, use the same consultant is the best. Definitely use the same consultant. If you're doing pre and post, if you're only doing one or the other, I think post is more important yeah, personally yeah. for me. Yeah, uh, I think so. Because you're going back into your home. Um, I'm also seeing, I work with a lot of realtors and home inspectors and things like that. So I'm seeing a lot of people who are requesting reports on what did you do for your home to ensure that it's safe to even sell. Um, you know, I know it's not something that's required, there's no regulations, but even having something that deems the remediation a success can be important for you as well moving forward, you know, when you do try to go sell your home or anything like that. You, you can have, you can take before and after pictures, you can, pay somebody to write a report on what the extent was. Um, you can keep records of bills. They should detail a little bit about what they did. Um, and and, uh, um, and you, you can, can request visual to, reports without testing as well. Yeah. Um, can't well, guarantee people, anything. No, no number wise, but yeah. visually. Yeah. People, there's a white glove test that, that sometimes is used in the lead industry <laughs> to, to verify, well, just to verify that that, yeah. that surfaces were clean, really. Yep. And that's pretty easy to verify with a white glove if Four they days. even went there, you know. But. All right, well, let me, let, me, uh, let me wrap us up here with this. So upcoming events, this is just where you can sign up for upcoming events on our website and also view recordings of past events and related resources. Uh, anyone having any issues with uh, your insurance, please don't hesitate to reach out to the 
Colorado Division of Insurance at this number, or you can email them. Um, so they're, they're working very hard to help you, so please share your concerns. They've also set up a website with you with additional resources, FAQs, um, and a lot of, a lot of information. Uh, we uh, just uh, reminding you of our Ask an Expert forum, register its fee, a free, not fee, sorry, um, right in to get your, uh, get your answers to your questions. Uh, again, thanking our, our donor and our funders. Uh, to, if you are not signed up for our mailing list, please don't hesitate to sign up. And I'm going to stop sharing my screen and I want to thank our experts and Amy. Uh, Dawn, I want to thank you for putting in the chat the, the link with the free, the, the coupon to make it a free download of your book. Uh, thank you for putting that out there. And um, Amy, anything you want to add? No, just to thank <clears throat> all three of our experts um, for, for uh, this has been a bit of a marathon, but I think that um, knowing how, um, how stressed out a lot of the standing homeowners have been um, and how uh, frustrated some many people have been by not getting the information uh, that they feel like they need from their insurers or not getting um, the authorization or, or getting having their insurers bring in um, professionals that they trust or authorize the right remediation. Um, you know, you've shed a lot of light tonight on, on um, I think, on people's concerns. You've confirmed a lot of what people have been worrying about. Um, and, you know, we just really appreciate uh, that all of you are in the in the game here, helping people out, um, Michael in the community and, and Janine as well, and Dawn, your willingness um, to come in if, if, um, if called. So um, I think, you know, we, as I started out the program saying, like, we know um, what's going on out there and how, because it's kind of what's been happening after pretty much all the major fires in, in recent years. You know, there's a lot of, um, there are litigation, there's litigation going on in, in California. There's probably gonna be litigation um, in Colorado as well. And even though we don't want anyone to have to go that route, um, we also don't want you to um, have to give in and, and accept um, inadequate remediation of your home. So um, thank you again to our experts for, um, for giving all this really good information and Val for all the work that you put in to tonight's program. Well, thank you all for your time tonight, sorry. Uh, this was a lot of information, so we appreciate you hanging in for the end here and uh, look forward to seeing you on the 18th. And thank you, uh, Michael and Janine and Don, so much for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good evening. Thank you.